I need to I need to merge. I need to merge, truck. Truck, I need to merge. Which means you need to merge. All right, all right. That's that's one of us had to hit the brakes, and apparently it was me. You bastard. Yeah. Oh, and then you put your brakes on. Screw you. It's just it's real. It's just like real life. American Truck Simulator. That is why people go into sports. It's why people do anything, really. Why people like actually choose a profession that isn't just you know, well, it pays the bills. When people really choose what they're doing in life. The reason that they pursue things that are ridiculous and, and like, how are you ever going to be successful at that? And it's a one in a million shot and, you know, or things like skydiving and mountain climbing. But people make professions of that. They don't just go skydiving and go, oh my god, that was an amazing experience. I want to do it again sometime. They go, oh my god, that was a transcendental experience. I need to make this my life now because I've never felt so good before. Never felt this way. And that is fuel ahead. Fuel at Barstow. Get the hell out of my way! I'm just, I'm, yep, I've cut him off. I cut him off. I found some fuel. That's why people do the things they do. Because you have that transcendental experience. And it doesn't have to be something like, you know, a high-pressure sporting event. It doesn't have to be um, skydiving and mountain climbing. Your life's on the line. But people who have had this experience viscerally of being completely empty, being completely where they are in the moment and there is nothing else and there's a crowd cheering, there's people watching, if they lose grip of the wall they fucking die and they just want to do that more and more and more and more. The pe people who have had this experience of just being completely empty, no self, no mind, no me to get in my way, no thoughts in my head saying, oh but what if I mess it up, I'm just there because if I'm not there being forced into that situation. That's why people choose, you know, to do those kinds of things that a lot of us go, why would you do that? But it doesn't have to be that. I said on the last Zen's Day live stream, I think I mentioned, I alluded in some way to, you know, this experience happens in the garden. This experience happens for someone who enjoys gardening. You sit down and you start, all right, that's, I'll replace that headlight. You start gardening, and you just lose yourself in the activity. I stopped it! I... Okay. You lose yourself in the activity. You start digging up the weeds, you start planting the seeds, you start caring for it, you get the feeling of the, the soil under your fingernails, and your hands just in the soft silt, and everything, and you just lose yourself, and, you know, time still passes, and you are absolutely there and present for it, but... Time passes in a different way. It passes in a way more peaceful. Uh, I need to go out to the left. Nobody coming, thank God, because I didn't check. <laughs> I thought I was going right. It passes in a way that when you come back from it, you know that that was something special. And then you chase the dragon. <laughs> People have similar experience, you know, being addicted to drugs. Uh, because this experience of being empty and being, you know, just free in your own self and not bogged down by who you are and what you think and what your opinions are and the things that you've done and the places and the people you've talked to and the constant monkey that is in your head jumping up and down trying to make you feel like you know less of a person because of something that happened god knows when sometimes today you know self self criticism is is valid and everything but as i mentioned earlier if there's something you can do about it, no need to worry. And if there's nothing that can be done, no point in worrying. So, the word is samadhi, okay? At least, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's the word that I think is what it means in Zen, because my Zen master didn't talk about these things. He didn't talk about um, transcendental experiences. When you had one, you know, you'd go into him and tell him, Oh my god, Sunim. Uh, I don't, I can't explain to you what I just experienced, but you probably know if I just, and you tell him, uh, like, part of it, and he'd be like, that's wonderful, I'm glad you had that experience, I'm glad you told me about it, thank you. That's for you. I have nothing to say about your experience, because your experience was true, and it was real, and it was yours, and I'm adding that part in. Um, he never said that, but that's why he said that. Because... You know, a lot of times we tell people our experiences and we're looking for them to validate. And we can have our own experiences changed and colored 
by the way that other people respond when we tell them about them. We can change our own memories by the way that people like reflect our experiences back on us. So he actually encouraged us to not talk about our transcendental experiences like amongst each other, um, to not discuss them. Uh, because, you know, it, when you're, especially early in your practice, somebody else might change, you know, you can still be deluded. You're still a human being. And you have a true experience that you that just hits you right here and you know it's true. And you'll never not know it's true again, is what you'd like to say. But it's possible. It's possible to be deluded. And especially if you're Zen master, you come to your Zen master and tell him something happened and oh my god, and this is what it meant to me. And he sits there going, that's not what it meant to me. And he starts t talking to you about like what he thinks it should mean. That would really F you up, you know? Your experiences are your experiences, and when you have a true one, you know it. Um, but yeah, um, samadhi is the word that I'm familiar with to describe in the zone. Uh, that's what it's called in Zen. Uh, when you have the experience of pureness, of emptiness, of just being there, being exactly where you are, nothing else, no other, you know, bullshit dragging you down. No lies that you've told yourself, no lies that other people have told you, no worrying about what other people think, no worrying about what you think, because that's all uh, worrying about what other people think ever is, is worrying about what you think, and what uh, your mind will come up with when people reflect it back, reflect something back to you. You see it in their eyes, and then you have to think it. Samadhi is what we call in the zone, and it's an experience that you no doubt have. My Zen master used to say everyone has this experience multiple times a day, um, but often it's too brief, and we don't value it, and we don't... too brief to, like, notice and to grab onto, uh, very much because we've been trained in, certainly in Western culture, but in Eastern culture as well, uh, to value our, our thinking minds, our ideas. We are nothing but our thoughts and our opinions and our very complicated web of uh you know because this is this this is this and that is that and now i've got a crystalline form in my head that has structure and it's rigid in its form and that makes it real which makes me real <coughs> if my thoughts are not valid if my thoughts are not strong and rigid if I can't chain them all together into a complete ethos and philosophy and an identity, then what am I? Who am I? We identify ourselves by that, that monkey mind that's jumping around constantly, always trying to put everything that it sees and experiences into a box and define it and say, that was that and this is this. I'm here, you're there, I'm me, you're you. The dog barked outside the house. Last live stream I talked about, last Zen's Day live stream, Wednesdays is when we do this, um, I talked about um, my first koan, my first kwadu, which was, you know, when, uh, what is it, when, what calls you to the interview? My Zen master would ring a bell and we would come to the interview while we were sitting in meditation. That was the sign to, to come to interview. And my first spiritual question was as simple as that. What calls you to the interview? And my first answer was as simple as the bell. And my Zen master challenged me to deepen it. And I'll tell you what, I wasn't trying to figure that that Kwadu out on the mat when I experienced the experience he was trying to get me to have. What I was doing at the time that I experienced the experience he was trying to get me to have, which was one of emptiness, and one of breaking down those boxes and those walls that I'm talking about, those definitions of the dog barked outside the house. What I was doing was sitting on my meditation mat as I had developed into a regular practice without being told necessarily by my Zen master. He had told us before, you know, you can do this as a practice. But he hadn't told me to do that practice. He had given me koans and quadus what I had decided to do on my own. So, you know, I'm really following my Zen Master's teachings there, aren't I? What I had decided to do at that time uh, was I was listening to the grandfather clock. 
What's the speed limit here? Okay, hi. How you doing? Just merge on over. <laughs> what I was doing at that time was listening to the grandfather clock in the Zen Hall. Ticking. I was breathing. I was feeling my breath enter my stomach, leave from my stomach, focusing my breath, but focusing actually not on my breath. It's maintaining my breath. But I wasn't focusing on my breath. I was focusing on the sound of the grandfather clock ticking, tick, tick, tick. And I'd been doing this for several weeks. I'd done it off and on throughout my, um, my Zen career. And, you know, the first time you hear a clock like that in a room, you just hear the tick. And the longer that you listen to it, especially if, you know, you take the opportunity to sit down and listen. You know, if someone creates that safe space in the universe for you to not be doing something, not be accomplishing something, not be you know, dominating the world or making uh, your life better or making money or finding love. Or... When you take that safe space for someone like my Zen master creates a Zen hall and it's a safe space for you to just sit down and experience what's happening right here and you can listen to the ticking of a grandfather clock, I heard so much in that grandfather clock. I could tell stories about that grandfather clock just sitting there listening to it. Because that one tick that you hear on the surface level has uh, about three ticks going on separately. And those ticks are made up of the creaking and grinding and rubbing of the gears and there's a coil in that grandfather clock that I'd never thought about, but I, I learned, I eventually, I heard it. I could hear the coil, the spring that was tightening with every tick, every single tick. I could hear the ticks changing depending on what time of the hour it was. I could tell what time it was within like five minutes by how the grandfather clock sounded. That coil, that spring in there is tightening because on the half hour, it's going to bong, and on the hour, it's going to bong as many hours as it is, up to 12. And you could hear that. I heard it all. I heard all of the ticks. There, there's many different ticks going on in there. I could hear the gears grinding in between them. I could hear the rubbing of everything. I could hear the spring tightening and changing the sound of each of the ticks. I could hear little, occasionally there's a metal ping on like the fourth tick sometimes. Sometimes it's not there, but then when it gets into a rhythm, it's there constantly. I could tell stories about that grandfather clock because I, I took the time and, and had the experience of just listening to it. I went so deep into that grandfather clock with my hearing. Deeper than most other things I've done in my life. And it was while I was doing that that I had the experience my Zen master was trying to get me to when he asked me what calls you to the, to the, or, yeah, what calls you to the interview, the sound of the bell. My answer was I heard the sound of the bell eventually. That was the last answer I ever gave him in words, and I just never found a way to tell him. But the experience that I had was well being so deeply entrenched in the grandfather clock. My consciousness, my third eye, just like in the clock. I'm listening to it. I've lost myself completely to the clock. There's just the sound of the clock. Well, I was hearing all those distinct ticks from all those different gears and all those different this and that. A dog barked. A dog barked outside the Zen Hall. A dog barked outside the Zen Hall. Noun, <laughs> a object, verbed, place. <laughs> Noun, the boxes of that sentence. The dog barked outside the Zen Hall while my hearing was basically my entire being and while I was completely enraptured in the clock. I'm tired again! 
And when that dog barked, there were no, there, there weren't three ticks anymore. There weren't three ticks and there weren't th the gears grinding against each other and there was no coil winding up to the hour and there was no dog and there was no bark. The dog barked and all sound became one. It was just right here. It wasn't over there. My consciousness wasn't inside the grandfather clock over there listening to the ticks of all these little gears that I'd put in, in conceptual boxes in my head. I could still hear everything individually, distinctly. It's not as though it all turned into something different, but it did. It turned into something different. Because it was all one thing. There wasn't a dog barking. There wasn't the sound of a dog barking. It was just this moment and these sounds all as one. And that is the experience that he wanted me to have. Asking me what calls you to the interview. Asking me to focus and deepen my perception of the idea of the bell and it ringing. The subject and the object, me versus you, the space in between, the nouns, the words, the ideas that we wrap things in. For that moment, and for a few seconds afterwards, everything was literally one. That's the experience he was going for. So when I talk about being in the zone, it's about attaining emptiness. It's about being just doing what you're doing, completely there. No other mind, no house divided against itself, which is what we are most of the time, especially in this culture, a house divided against itself. Our minds are exactly that. Okay, I'm very tired. I understand, give me my, and there's a place to sleep right here, I'll pull up. <laughs> most of the time, that's what we are, you know? You are arguing with yourself. You are yourself perceiving yourself subjectively. And you are arguing with yourself about what's right and what's wrong, what you should do next, what you should be doing now, what you should have done before. And none of those things exist. There's no past. There's no future. There's not even, and this one's harder to wrap your head around, there's not even this moment. Zen says, you know, you need to live in this moment. You need to experience just this moment. And that's true. And when you have to put it into words, you describe it as saying, just this moment. But when you... Damn it. Keep hitting E. When you're in just this moment, this moment ceases to be. And there is just this. Which is also something that there isn't. Because it's not this. This is a concept. I need to sleep, not get gas. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I can sleep over here. I came in here, I was thinking of just sleep. I was just thinking gas. It's distracted. Yeah, listen to the distracted guy talk about Zen. He knows. <laughs> hey, that's how I know. I've done a lot of being distracted. Park us up and have us asleep. Lol, Pong gets it. I argue with myself all the time because I suck and hate myself, says RMAJ. That's the experience. We're all having that experience with you, RMAJ. We're human beings. That's what we do. Um, and the practice of Zen, because that's what it is. A practice, not a religion. You don't have to believe in anything. Uh, it's a practice. You sit down, you create that safe space I'm talking about, where you can spend your time listening to the clock where you can spend your time just breathing and following your breath as it rises and falls in your stomach. Focusing your mind and letting your mind know that it's okay to relax. You don't have to be doing this all fucking day, night, and. You don't have to be. Mind, it's all right. We could have, but what if we just did peace? 
what if instead of thinking about everything and worrying that if we don't think about everything then something's going to be left undone and if we don't think about everything then you know we're not uh, as smart as the other person uh, we're not as uh, on the ball we're not going to make the right decisions if we're not prepared for them <laughs> brain 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 Shh. come with me let me show you that there's another way it's okay you can just be and when you get that fucking monkey to shut up, you get to see the world differently. You get to see the world without all that white noise that's in your head, without all that static. You get to be completely present. You get to experience the this moment that doesn't exist, because once you experience it... Son of a bitch! This moment sucks! <laughs> I gotta go to the way station again. When you experience it, you realize that there isn't even this moment. Because you're not there for it. It's not happening. There's just what? There's just this. You are this. You're not present for it. And yet, being not present for it is the most present that you have ever been in your life. Okay, slow down, because there's cops usually around these things. Last time I got a ticket while I was just leaving. Ronan Pawn, I hear all those detailed sounds all the time, and old clocks sometimes drive me nuts because they're all I can hear. Some people focus on them uh, a lot easier. Um, and, uh, I mean, you think about, like, clockmakers and clock repairers, you know, uh, from an era gone by. This is how, you know, you brought a clock into a clockmaker uh, to be repaired or something. He'd sit your clock down, and he'd go, Okay, yeah, I know what I need to fix. Come back in an hour. And the person who brought that clock in would be like, this guy's fucking magic. How did he do that? Because <laughs> he can hear it. I mean, I can sit down and listen to a grandfather clock these days and, you know, find the gears and find the pings and the pangs and the winding and stuff like that because I've listened for it. But the act of listening for it, you find out, like, how much more there is there than you're perceiving, you know? And... If you hear the ticks of the grandfather clock, that's great. I'll bet you don't see the things that other people see, you know? Some people. You, you know, or you don't hear other things, you know? Um, there's always something that's going to escape your consciousness. <laughs> Except when you're existing just in this moment. But creating that safe space where you can just have those experiences is what Zen is about. You know, the story of Shakyamuni Buddha is of a, you know, I, I'm going to call him a crazy guy. I'm going to call him a lunatic, a psycho. Uh, he was so consumed by his despair and his just, everywhere he looked in life, he saw pain and he saw suffering. And it wasn't because the pain and suffering wasn't there. It's there, it's real, and if you look for it, you'll find it. Not just because you tend to find whatever you're looking for, regardless of what it is, but because it's real and it's there. He saw it all, and it just weighed on his soul and his consciousness. And to a certain way of thinking, it drove the man insane. He, he chased down every spiritual practice he could find in the day. He went into the, to the wilderness with, with uh, what were monks at that time. Okay, cops ahead, gonna have to slow down. Uh, and, and, you know, did whatever their, uh, weird, obscure practices were. Okay, I would move over, but they didn't give me room, and they're passing by me. <laughs> so I guess it's okay. He chased down all kinds of different spiritual practices. Eventually, he went into a forest, got naked, and decided, I'm just gonna live like this, and I'm gonna take as little as I possibly need to survive, and I'm gonna, like, asceticism. Asceticism? Asceticism. A life of denying yourself all pleasure, denying yourself all distraction, sort of, sort of throwing yourself as deeply into pain as humanly possible to try and find out where the bottom is, if there is a bottom, and find out what pain and suffering is about. And he did that for years and years and years, and one day it clicked with him, this is bullshit, this is not going anywhere. I'm not getting any further in this spiritual practice than any of the others that I could possibly that I've tried before, and I've tried all of them that everybody ever presented to me, that I ever heard about. And so he walked out of the forest, uh, came upon a maiden. She had some milk that she was carrying, some water. She offered it to him, and she was like, he was like, yeah, give me some milk. Give me some meat. 
I've been living in the forest, eating nuts and seeds, and needing as little as I possibly could each day to just stay alive in order to try and purify myself, clean myself of everything so that I could just see clearly. And it was a waste of time because it was still a self, selfish, self-involved action. It was all about him. It was all about his experience. And eventually, he got so frustrated that he invented Zen by saying, fuck it. This is how crazy the guy was. Fuck it. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna sit down in front of this tree, the Bodhi tree. I'm gonna sit down in front of this tree and I'm gonna meditate and I'm just not gonna get up until I've either found what I'm looking for, found what's missing in me, answered this, this non-question question that's hovered around my entire existence, or I die. Either fulfillment or death. And he sat in meditation 24 hours a day for seven days straight after a life spent developing spiritual practices and techniques. So, you know, it's not a guarantee that if you sit down for seven days straight 24 hours that it'll happen for you. I do guarantee if you sit down for seven days straight 24 hours, you will have an, a life-changing experience. Maybe not Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening, but you will have a life-changing experience. <coughs> And, um, after seven days of torture that in the Dharma texts is described as demons and devils coming to him and trying to tempt him off the mat, not unlike the stories of Jesus in the desert, trying to be, you know, Satan trying to tempt him to, to away from his 40-day uh, ritual that he did in the desert. Demon, they, they tell it as demons and, and you know, the gods of, of folklore coming to him and trying to tempt him away and, and arguing with him. What all that is, is his mind. After seven days of being tortured by his mind, his own mind giving him every reason to get up, telling him this is stupid, the hell do you think this accomplishes? You're gonna die on this mat? Dude, let's go back and find the handmaiden with the milk. Maybe she'll let us, you know, tap that, you know? Come. After seven days of his mind taking him through hell, His mind finally shut the fuck up. And he had the experience of united being, of emptiness, of pureness. It clicked, the hole in his belly was filled, the answer, the, the missing answer of his life's question. Seven days on the meditation mat, It wasn't, it wasn't a snap, either. It definitely wasn't. It was an entire lifetime, I think I mentioned. And that's how Zen was born. It's a practice. It's a practice, not a religion. And all the demons and the angels and the, the bodhisattvas and all that kind of stuff. Take it or leave it. If it helps you, if you like the idea, run with it. If it gets in the way, drop it. Zen is sitting down, shutting up, and giving your mind the freedom. And actually training your mind to just be okay with just being here as we are nothing else to become nowhere else to go we will become other things we will go other places but here and now we're this what is so wrong with that brain a guy called Pi cheered five some time ago. That's a bit like I loaned my friend some video games and instead of letting me play them with him, he just tied me to his bed for six hours and left me alone. That gave me quite some time to rethink some things. <laughs> well, if you were thinking about things during those six hours, that wasn't Zen. But, <laughs> it is Zen. Because most of Zen, I mean, you know, the Buddha's experience, Shakyamuni's Buddha's experience, and every practitioner of Zen's experience is sitting down on the mat, having been given a safe space by other uh, more practiced spiritual uh, practitioners in order to do that. You know, you have permission here to just sit and do this practice. We're not going to expect anything else of you. Just breathe. Um, and most of the experience of actually practicing Zen is sitting there and thinking not being able to stop it. 
and the fighting it. And then the learning that, oh, I can't fight it. That's not the way. <laughs> it's, it's like, there's a reason monks, uh, it's a lifetime practice, you know? It's a lifelong practice. It's not something, I was there for three years, and I had a lot of, a lot of spiritual awakenings, a lot of experiences. I am more a man than I ever would have been. I am more an adult male uh, human being capable of making my own decisions and capable of making decisions that people disagree with around me and telling them to just go to hell than I ever would have been without my time in the Zen Center. When I entered the Zen Center at like age 29 or 30, I'm dating myself, I think, I think before I turned 30, I think I was 29 or something like that, late 20s. I didn't feel like a man. I didn't feel like an adult. I felt like a child. I felt like a child, a teenager actually, is what I felt like. Still a teenager in my late 20s, just struggling to know what I was supposed to be doing, you know? The world had a lot of ideas about what I was supposed to be doing around me, and all of them seemed incredibly stupid and did not help me answer the questions I contained. I'm going to slow down because right now I'm passing a cop. I'm going to keep passing the cop, but a little bit slower. Yeah. And in my own lane, probably would be a good idea. I didn't feel like a man. It took... It, it actually took... You know what it took in order to make me feel like a man? To make me feel like an adult? Capable of, like, having children? and having something to pass on to them, and not feeling like, oh my god, I shouldn't be having children, I'm a child. You know what it took? Seven days on a meditation mat. And I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. The Shakyamuni Buddha's experience is what it took for me. Because I practiced at the Zen Center for somewhere between three to six months before, um... I was invited to a meditation retreat. And a meditation retreat is just that. Seven days meditation. Not 24 hours, seven, seven days a week. Not 24 hours a day. Uh, that's some hardcore shit right there. And no one would show up <laughs> if you told them, that's what we're doing. Do you want to come? Nope. Not, not in this culture. Hell no. That is for monks. And you do that, you go off to the mountains with other monks and you do that. Um, and... Uh, actually, they do stuff like that, not 24 hours a day, but like 14 hours a day, 12, in fact, 12 to 16 hour a day, like meditation uh, sessions. Uh, monks do that for three months out of a year in Korea, South Korea. The real Korea. No. <laughs> three months. I was invited to a meditation retreat at the Zen Center. It was seven days of meditation. Uh, probably eight maybe 10, but I think 8 hours of formal meditation, sitting on a pillow in the meditation hall, meditating, meditating, uh, and then everything else that you did for those 7 days never left the grounds. You left the building, but you never left the block. You know, you could go walk in the Peace Garden and that kind of stuff to just, you know, get some outside air. Uh, but 7 days, everything you did, even when you weren't on the meditation mat, was meditation. We ate in meditation, quiet meditation. Um, you know, everyone at the dinner table was watching, you know, all the people in charge, all the monks who knew what, how you're supposed to do something. It was a very formal, rigid way to eat. Uh, and the idea is you learn that method of eating. Like, this is, this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have another tangent here because this is important to, like, explain why there are these weird ritualistic things in Zen. The reason why there's a special way to eat there's a special way to enter the Zen Hall, why they have you bow in front of the thing, and when you walk into, you know, the Zen Center, you take your shoes off and you turn them around and you put them a certain way, and when you eat, you lift the bowl with one hand and you eat with the other, and you do, and you wash the bowl in a certain way and all that kind of stuff. All of those rituals are there simply so that there is a prescribed method of doing it that you learn, and then once you know how to do it, if you're not doing it right, then the people who are trying to help you keep your mind on your meditation 
will see that you're not doing it right and know that your mind's drifting. Know that you need a, a little, you know, push, helping hand back to the back to the straight and narrow. That's all that's for, and all that stuff that you know people people get turned off by it because you know we're a very non-religious society anymore. We don't like religion in general, and um, you walk into a Zen center and they ask you to you know here's what you do you you bow to the altar and people go whoa 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 you're gonna bow to an altar dude. You know, I'm not worshipping your plastic gods. People get turned off by that. People will turn around and walk out when you tell them, you can't come in unless you do it. And we told them, you can't come in unless you do it. People wanted to come into the Zen hall with their socks on. So you can't come in unless you take your socks off. Or you give us, like, a medical note for why you have to have socks. Okay, this is how it's done. There's a method and there's a reason for the method. And all of those methods are there simply so that there's a way because if everybody has their own little custom way of doing everything then how am I supposed to know if I'm your senior student and I'm looking at you and I'm supposed to be trying to help you with a very difficult practice how am I supposed to know when you know your mind is twisting you up in knots when you're you know off in la la land how am I supposed to help you with that that's all that is. Zen is not a religion. It's a practice. Everything we did for those seven days was meditation. Formal meditation, eating meditation, working meditation, preparing the food that we ate, meditation, sleeping meditation. I don't think any of us uh, you know, who were training that day were able to achieve anything that you could call sleeping meditation. Other than that, we were so fucking tired at the end of those days that we passed right the fuck out. And you could call that meditation. No thinking going on. I blacked out. <laughs> Everything we did for seven days was meditation and that experience. By the end of it, I had had my first awakening, my first spiritual experience. And uh, that was exactly what it took for me to feel like an adult, like a man and not a man boy, not a teenager, desperate for others' approval. Not someone who couldn't possibly have children. In fact, after the seven days, in my final interview with the Zen Master, the seventh day of my meditation, we went in, it was the final interview, everything was wrapping up, we're all still sitting in meditation, but we're all going in for our final interviews. And, you know, I go in and my, my Sunim, my, my Zen Master, he says to me, you know, uh, you should be proud of what you've done here today, uh, this week. Uh, and he, he made the you know caveat of not proud in the prideful sense, but you've done something here, you know, you should really be proud. And I I don't remember if I actually said it to him or if I just thought it so loud that I I believed that I said it to him. But I said what I was saying in my head if I didn't say it aloud was I could be a father now. I'm pretty sure I I said that to him. I could be a father. Now. I could have never imagined that before those seven days on the meditation mat. 